Good morning to the summer school of effective uh, HPC in climate and weather. Today we have two exciting sessions about storage. The first session is modern storage and it's chaired by Sai from Seagate Hello. and Constantinos from DDN. And I'm looking forward to this exciting session. Yeah, great. Thank you, Julian. Uh, so maybe uh, Constantinos, do you want to uh, maybe quickly introduce yourself? Perhaps maybe you and I can uh, give a quick introduction. Sorry. Sai, yes, please go ahead and introduce her and then I will follow. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, uh, my name is Sai Narsim Murthy. So, uh, I've been involved in, uh, I've been with Seagate. I uh, manage uh, the EU R&D activities and uh, I've been in uh, storage for a long time, for the last 20 years almost. And uh, weather and climate is a very exciting area for us uh, because it's one area which is extremely data intensive and uh, it's a great opportunity for us to uh, work uh, you know work with this community and uh, primarily our focus uh, within these uh, SEVAs and these projects is uh, we, we are uh, Seagate is working on a uh, object storage uh, technology uh, it's called uh, uh, Miro M E R O and uh, we will be open sourcing it uh, sometime very soon so we are quite excited about it so yeah we just want to keep the discussion very informal and uh, you know uh, yeah, yeah, just just let me know if you have questions. <clears throat> so good morning uh, from my side also. My name is Konstantinos Fasavis. Uh, I am uh, working at the DDN um, uh, from Germany. So initially uh, this was uh, 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 Jan Thomas, uh, a colleague of mine, Aquac Viva, was supposed to give this talk, but unfortunately he couldn't make it. So I am here to replace him and I hope that I'll do as good job as uh, he would have done. Uh, done. So uh, DTN is, of course, always interested in uh, uh, <coughs> data intelligent applications. Uh, storage is what is what uh, what we are interested in, and of course, the weather community and uh, the climate community is uh, one of the major uh, communities that uh, are uh, I/O intensive. Uh, uh, applications, they have IO test applications, and we are always uh, interested in working uh, with you. Uh, within the Easy Waste project, uh, we have some um, interesting uh, tasks that we are working. Uh, we have the uh, integration of uh, the IME native API for uh, uh, the ECDM, and we also work on another very interesting uh, topic. I don't know if uh, you are familiar, but we are working for the so-called uh, active storage, where the storage servers will uh, be able to compute, uh, um, like MPI reduction, some functions, and uh, will not really send all the data to the clients, mm -hmm. but will send already a result that will really minimize uh, network traffic and uh, improve uh, uh, performance. So without further ado, uh, let's continue in, uh, uh, in this presentation. Uh, we uh, have. Uh, yeah. Sir. So next slide. How do I do it here? Julian, how do I do the next slide? Uh, can you click on the open slide navigator? Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. It's on the bottom, in fact. Yes, on the yes, I, found, yeah, yeah, I found, I found. Yeah. So it's the first time that I'm using this uh, mm -hmm. nice software. It's really nice. So um, uh, this presentation is not really um, uh, designed uh, to follow any uh, vendor uh, uh, views. Mm -hmm. We have made this presentation as possible uh, vendor agnostic and uh, the views here are reflected and uh, the opinions are uh, <coughs> only personal views. So it's not that uh, what we're saying today will represent uh, DDN, at least from uh, our side. Next, uh, here is the outline of today's presentation. So uh, I will uh, start with uh, an infrastructure hardware. We'll go back in the history of uh, storage device evolutions. We'll see uh, what uh, 
what has changed and how this uh, impacts the uh, the, st uh, the storage uh, stack and uh, we'll see uh, also what is going to change and uh, what is the current trend then uh, Sai will continue Sai, please go forward yeah. and explain what you're going to discuss yeah sure so yeah i'll uh, as uh, cosentinos is presenting the infrastructure hardware i'll also provide some uh, whenever i have so many uh, thoughts or comments uh, i will add that as well then I will present an overview of, uh, you know, uh, the IO libraries and uh, all the uh, mechanisms for accessing storage. Uh, uh, so that then I'll also present some of the storage trends and possible futures. Uh, you know, what's happening in the industry, what's what we are seeing uh, in, uh, you know, in the research community. Uh, I'll present some of that. Uh, so yeah, so we'll try to keep it to one hour. We have got a lot of material. Uh, so uh, we'll try and see how quickly we can uh, go through that. So uh, so from nine to ten, and after after ten o'clock, I think uh, so. Uh, it it will be Constantinos uh, 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 handling the other part of the session, and I will drop out after ten o'clock. So Constantinos, you want to mention yeah. after ten? Yes. So uh, after ten, we will uh, have an introduction to the data and monitoring tool. So. Uh, uh, what the, what we will do is that uh, uh, I will give you a small intro into the tool, why we uh, use it, and then I will show you how you can install it, how you can use it. We will have a break, and after the break, we will come back and we can uh, have a hands-on uh, session. Uh, in this session, um, I will provide uh, four different applications, and we will use Darsan to see how we can uh, monitor these applications and uh, what can we um, uh, what can we do with that? So um, just uh, to ease the uh, hands-on session, uh, I hope that all of you have already downloaded the virtual machine. Uh, if you have not uh, downloaded the virtual machine, please uh, go ahead and do it right now. It might take some time. You will need, I think, VirtualBox to 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 use it. Uh, for me personally, I'm not gonna use the virtual machine. I'm gonna use a, uh, an an actual uh, machine because it was running a bit slow in my uh, in my system uh, and we will have to install a few more packages but uh, we will come back uh, to that uh, later so let's continue with uh, uh, the presentation so the first thing that um, I, I know like everyone knows it but i always start, li like to start from this slide because it really gives you uh, the uh, the base to uh, to build on. So uh, storage devices have many characteristics, right? What are the most important ones? Uh, first of all, the most important is the storage medium. And uh, we have uh, different uh, storage medium. We have the magnetic tapes. Uh, uh, the, uh, we have the hard disk drives are all also uh, based on uh, uh, magnetic field to store uh, data. And then we have the solid state uh, drives. We have the non-volatile memory, but uh, both of them are uh, flash memory, but uh, they use different connection to connect to, uh, uh, to the system. And then we have newer uh, technologies as uh, Intel Optane memory, that it is based on uh, 3DX point. I think um, so I uh, will talk about that in detail uh, later. Uh, then, uh, uh, regarding the performance of uh, the storage devices, we have the throughput, that it is how many bytes uh, we can pass uh, per second. We usually now have uh, in the range of a uh, gigabyte. Then we have the latency, that it is uh, how much time does it need to perform a single uh, operation? What is the minimum we have to wait for an IO operation to complete? Uh, then we have the so-called uh, IOPS, that it is how many operations they can be performed per second. Uh, of course, so we have the capacity, that it is how many data we can store in the device, and the connection type, uh, that it is the connection protocol uh, that we use to connect the storage device to, uh, to the system. This plays actually a huge role. We will see that in the next slides. So having all these uh, uh, characteristics, uh, we uh, 
come to uh, really uh, uh, lots of possibilities because uh, different sort of devices uh, uh, are good in different uh, 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 parameters. So it's not like uh, we have one device that it is good for all of these. And uh, what we have to do is uh, nowadays we have to do a mix and match. So we will be able to take uh, uh, the advantages of each different storage device and present a storage system that would be uh, uh, performing really well in all the uh, circumstances. Uh, for example, uh, we can um, have uh, hard disk drives in a parallel file system to achieve um, uh, better uh, throughput and uh, also huge capacity, but uh, this will not give us uh, benefits that uh, the flash storage gives us. So we have to integrate uh, flash storage also into the uh, storage sessions. Uh, systems and uh, Sai will uh, talk uh, in the next uh, part of the presentation on how we can do uh, uh, such integrations and the deep and multi um, tier uh, storage. Sai, please uh, feel free to always interrupt me and uh, yep. uh, add, add, add to my presentation. Yeah, we do. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So here are two slides and uh, I I think it's quite uh, like uh, important to understand how uh, the hard disk drives have uh, evolved mm -hmm. over uh, time. And we have uh, the first one that uh, the green line represents uh, the capacity in megabytes and uh, the blue line represents the kilobyte uh, uh, rate uh, per time, the throughput uh, per second, the throughput. Uh, what we can see is that uh, we have a really good uh, uh, performance improvement uh, in regards of uh, capacity, but the actual transfer uh, rate is not really improve, improving so much. Yeah. Then in the other, then in the other uh, uh, figure, uh, we have the relative performance improvement of uh, CPU versus the uh, HDD performance, and this is uh, really what we see here. It's the I/O performance, uh, uh, CPU and I/O performance uh, gap. So, uh, as we know, like the more low, it's already um, uh, more or less uh, every 18 months we double the CPU performance, but uh, the hard drive performance is not nearly uh, uh, there. So as we um, uh, were going from the 90s to uh, the zeros and uh, uh, 2010, this, uh, this gap was really uh, uh, being uh, uh, increasing and was huge, but uh, likely we have um, newer devices that are trying to lower uh, this gap between the CPU performance and the storage device performance. So if you if I can just add one comment is it's mainly because of uh, if you go one slide back uh, Constantino. Yes. So it's mainly because of all the uh, there was a big gap between CPU and HDD and then there was all the heterogeneity multi core multi core so that but on the switch side uh, the hard disks are not, really not keeping up. Uh, so it's the gap is getting even worse. So this is just a kind of an indicative gra uh, you know, gap between CPU and uh, hard drive performance. So I mean, uh, from a storage standpoint, there is uh, lots and lots of innovation that needs to happen in the way in which we actually uh, put all these pieces together to narrow the gap and still we are very far away. So that's one comment. And the second comment is that, uh, so capacity is increasing like crazy. Because if you, just from a Seagate, uh, like a, from our company, right? So you have things like uh, uh, this from this uh, heat assisted magnetic recording, hammer drives, and then from Western Digital, there is uh, mammal drives. So uh, the, the densities in a single hard drive, you can get like almost uh, tens of terabytes of capacity. So it's extremely, things are getting extremely dense, uh, but uh, the transfer rates are remaining the same. So even the top graph, Right, even that graph is getting uh, as as a uh, uh, Constantinos indicated. Even that's getting worse. So this this kind of is a, a fundamental problem 
in storage systems and uh, it, that's why we are you know uh, we are here to uh, look at these problems <coughs> thanks thanks, thanks yeah so um, in this slide uh, i i we have a table that uh, gives us the comparison between the ssds and the hdds the ssds is uh, the solid state drives that are based on uh, flash technology uh, what we can uh, take from here and what is the most important is that uh, here the access time is uh, really uh, much lower uh, or order of mag use and also the uh, random IO performance is uh, improving uh, and uh, by uh, by more than than a thousand I think this is even a bit uh, old graph um, so uh, using such devices we can uh, for sure improve uh, the performance of the storage system and lower the gap between the CPU and the uh, storage uh, system yeah and also one comment is also you have a look at the energy uh, so we really have to keep the uh, energy consumption also in mind uh, so that's also becoming very critical because as you go to uh, as you are building bigger and bigger hpc systems as you go towards excess scale energy is becoming more and more critical uh, so we need to really keep a mind uh, keep uh, keep an eye on how much uh, energy consumption is there for these devices so all that comes into play as well uh, when you build the architecture yeah yeah next slide uh, yeah, of course, uh, these devices are uh, faster, they consume uh, less energy, as I said. Uh, but the problem is that uh, they're still uh, very expensive in comparison to um, the yeah. HDD. And here is, um, is a graph. So we see that uh, uh, initially in uh, 2013, they were really like 40 times more expensive. Uh, uh, but uh, now the performance, uh, the uh, the difference is not uh, is not as huge. It's decreasing. However, uh, it will never be the same that uh, we will have to pay the same for um, an SSD and the same uh, yeah. for an HDD for the same capacity. So the trend is going down, but it will never reach uh, that. It will be nearly nearly comparable. It will always be uh, some uh, some uh, uh, sometimes more uh, expensive, not yeah. just a bit more. Yeah. And because hard drives are getting a lot cheaper, if you, if you look at uh, hard drive densities are getting so high, so price per price per gigabyte for a hard drive, uh, for data in a hard disk, it's getting, so that line, the bottom line that you see is actually, uh, it's going down. Uh, so uh, it's hard, hard storage in a hard drive is becoming very, very cheap. Uh, so that you, know, you need to keep that in mind as well. But yeah, as, as Constantino said, uh, SSDs are getting cheaper and that's why you see many companies adopting SSDs in enterprise. And, and as we'll see today, you know, uh, we are starting to see uh, interesting use cases for SSDs in uh, HPC as well in the last few years. But it will never be in the point where uh, we can just uh, replace it. Yeah, with, exactly. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And this is, this is what this slide says, that if you want yeah. to build a large system with lots of capacity, you will never be able to do it with uh, only SSDs. Exactly. So, and uh, many, many people keep saying that, for example, disk drive vendors like Western Digital, Seagate, they keep telling me, for example, hey, you guys will go out of business. <laughs> There's uh, no one's going to buy HDDs anymore. But yeah. it's it's very interesting to see that uh, uh, these storage devices, it's uh, they never go away. It just goes in a different point in the stack. You know, uh, it, it was scratch and it goes to a lower so things keep moving up and down the stack and even today you have tape which people thought will go away for the last 25 years so there's always a place for storage uh, technology in the stack and as Constantino said it depends on what I think Constantinos you probably have same opinion right on hard drives yeah. you think hard drives will disappear or no the problem with storage is that we are uh like uh, the, as the economic people say we are an elastic uh, market it's like uh, however uh, and how many 
gigabytes of storage, terabytes of storage you give to customers, they will always need more. Uh, I don't know, like yeah. if you give uh, someone uh, 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 the ability to buy cars, he will buy, I don't know, maybe two, three, five cars, and then he will be, okay, yeah. I have enough. But uh, <laughs> no one will be satisfied uh, to have enough storage. We um, always want to store more data. We always want to preserve our history. And if you see, we only have history of a uh, few decades and actually with high quality content, only a few years, right? And the quality of the content is always increasing. So we will always have to store more data. Nobody wants to, uh, to delete. They always want to store and preserve. Exactly. And, and so, also one, uh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Constantinos. No, no, no. What I said is like uh, hard uh, disk drives and even tapes uh, are not uh, close to uh, to the end. We want uh, to have uh, um, uh, and to maintain results for uh, for decades. I think in the climate community, we you have to at least for ten years preserve mm -hmm. uh, data for uh, the experiments that you did. And uh, of course, as the grid resolutions increase, the amount of data uh, increase also, and we will not be able to do that without using uh, hard disk drives. And uh, just, just just one last comment is, uh, so uh, uh, there was a study done by IDC. So this was all the total amount of data stored overall uh, in the world and how much data is actually being used. So the amount of data that's generated by all the communities in the world, uh, it's, 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 I think, uh, 90, 95% or 93% is actually data that's not, you cannot store it anywhere. And you are, uh, the community is currently storing about 10% uh, of the data today. So all the 90% of the data that, that is generated by uh, Internet of Things and sensors and what have you, so they, they they just stay for some time and they just disappear because you're not able to store it. Uh, so that is what uh, you can call it as kind of like dark data, which you are not able to exploit anywhere, you know, anyhow. And uh, because of uh, uh, you know all the machine learning and AI, so they, they they are more and more data intensive. You need to store the data, and uh, even for HPC, there is more uh, uh, you know AI machine learning workflows that come into picture. So. There is a need to really store the data. You, uh, the more data you store, the more value you can extract. Uh, so uh, there they will always, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, uh, so the real uh, uh, attempt by the storage vendors and communities, how you can get to store more and more data at a lower and lower price. Uh, so yeah, that's, uh, that's how things are going. Um. So Nicola here asked uh, why uh, we think that HDDs uh, will not be replaced by SSDs. So I, I think it's uh, Sai just already answered. I don't know if you were satisfied with that. Uh, just to repeat uh, really uh, quickly, uh, the problem is that we will always generate uh, more data and H SSDs. Uh, flash storage will always be more expensive than uh, HDDs, so we will store, we will have to store more data, and the cheapest way to achieve that would be with uh, HDDs. I think this is like the bottom line, you know. And, yeah, it's, it's mainly the price. It's it's uh, mo most of the things in storage industry. It's driven by economics, uh, so uh, you can the ch HDDs are the cheapest way to store uh, data, and it's getting cheaper and cheaper, and it's also the densest. Uh, if you are a huge cloud provider, uh, you are a CSP, you want to store like uh, 100 and 200 petabytes, you, you cannot afford to have 200 petabytes of flash. <laughs> it's just a, just insane. So they will, uh, and this data is going to uh, increase all the time. So uh, uh, so that's why you always need, uh, uh, you know, a different, it's, it's a different point in your uh, stack where you, ha you have very dense storage at the bottom and performance storage at the top. So that there's place there's going to be place for everything. Okay, let's continue because we are running a bit late. Yeah. So um, then uh, we discussed that um, the storage medium really made a difference. So we have the flash and we have the magnetic, and this gives us advantages. So here is a, a slide where we see the difference between. Uh, the protocol used to access uh, the uh, the medium. 
So in the first one, uh, uh, the first figure, the first uh, uh, blue box, uh, this one, uh, here is throughput at the uh, x-axis is throughput and the y-axis are uh, different sort of devices. So in the first one, this block uh, uh, is the hard disk drive and the throughput that we are uh, getting. I don't know, it's like about 200 uh, maybe megabytes. Uh, then we have a flash storage with uh, uh, SSD solid state drive drives. And we use uh, the same uh, protocol, SATA protocol, that we use for the hard drives. Uh, and uh, this one is getting really obsolete uh, for uh, uh, flash storage. And we have a new air protocol that it is called uh, NVMe, Non-Volatile Memory Express Protocol, that uh, this one brings uh, really uh, the device much closer to the CPU. And we use the PCI Express channel to connect the flash storage to the system. And uh, using uh, this, uh, uh, this connection uh, protocol, we have a way better uh, throughput than uh, using older uh, protocols as uh, uh, SATA. So the connection time uh, type really plays a huge uh, benefit uh, and uh, can make a dramatic uh, difference. This is what this slide is about. So I will continue into that. So uh, apart, uh, apart uh, from uh, uh, the connection type uh, per se, the uh, evolution of storage stacks has been uh, huge also between the storage uh, um, software. So traditionally we had the uh, hard disk drives where uh, uh, the latency was about uh, in the range of tens of uh, milliseconds and we had a huge um, uh, uh, software uh, uh, layer stack. I'm going a bit fast because I think we are really late. We have to do like 60 slides so in almost uh, 40 minutes. I don't think that we will be able to do it. We'll see. And um, then uh, with SAS, uh, SSDs, uh, this one decreased. So we have fewer um, uh, layers that we have to cross until we reach the device. But um, with the NVMe protocol, uh, this one got really minimized to the bare minimum and uh, we only have to access the so-called um, VFS. This is the virtual file system. It's just a thin layer, so we have an abstraction between uh, the file system implementation and the file system uh, interface that it is offered to the application. And uh, we use the block layer and we are able to uh, talk directly to the SSD and that's uh, we bring uh, latency. Uh, less than uh, 100 uh, uh, microseconds. So here I have a slide where uh, we have the latency uh, compared uh, uh, to DRAM just to get an idea. So the CPU register is about like um, uh, 0 0.1 nanosecond if we want to, to access data. Then we have the cache that it is in the range of uh, tens of nanoseconds maybe. Uh, even less. DRAM is maybe a, uh, 10 times more. And uh, then we have the storage class memory side. We'll talk about that uh, in, uh, in the next part of the presentation, where we have close to uh, thousands uh, of uh, nanoseconds. And then we have the NVMe and the flash that it is in the range of uh, 10 uh, microseconds to 100 and the HDD is that it is in the range of tens of milliseconds. So we, we see here uh, a difference of uh, three zeros, and this is quite uh, really huge and dramatic. Uh, the same happens here with the uh, uh, storage class uh, memory and the NVMe. So of course, a storage system should integrate and must integrate uh, such, uh, such devices in order to bring the CPU to the storage uh, uh, gap uh, closer. Uh, here there is uh, a trace call of an IO path. So um, before we uh, we had a slide where we said that the IO to complete it has to pass through different um, layers. And here is just a breakdown of uh, these layers. Um, let's not go into details. We don't really 
have um, so much time for that. Uh, what uh, I want you to take from this is that we have these little boxes that are the software layers that uh, the, the x-axis is the time, okay? So this is the total time that the call will take. We'll start from the application, from the user base, and then it will uh, return to the application. So from here up to here, it's the total time of a, uh, an I.O. call. And then crossing the different layers is, of course, adding a bit of uh, execution time. But uh, here, the orange uh, box is uh, the time spent in the actual storage device. So traditionally, with HDD, this was, uh, this was really huge. And uh, in the next slide, this is really uh, actual numbers using an enterprise HDD. Uh, and we see that for an operation that it is taking about um, uh, 7,000 uh, milliseconds, 7,165 milliseconds, the actual time spent in uh, the storage device is uh, uh, the 7,023, and we only have uh, 142 milliseconds spent for crossing the uh, software layers in order to be able to talk to the device. So you are as fast as your slowest component, and even if you improve the software stack, you are not going to get really faster. So you will always be limited by the uh, hard disk like performance. Yeah, and that's mainly but, because, uh, yeah, sorry, Casey, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, the, the reason why it is so so bad is because, of course, we have a uh, rotating disk and uh, yeah. uh, we have uh, um, the disk uh, head to, to go around and this is really slow. With uh, flash storage, we don't have any magnetic uh, and uh, any uh, mechanical uh, parts in the in the drive, yeah. so it's it's getting uh, really faster. So and this is the uh, actual uh, result. So this is with HDD, and this is with uh, an NVMe. And uh, here uh, we see that uh, these uh, red, dark red that was dominating the execution time, it just became a small part, actually, of uh, the execution time. And here we see that uh, uh, the actual uh, uh, time spent in storage is less than uh, time spent in uh, uh, crossing the software stack. So, of course, software stack has to be optimized because it's not anymore your limiting uh, factors. So to do that, we have really to have a very thin uh, software stack. And this is uh, what the previous slide that we had um, was this slide. This is why we have to have a really thin uh, software stack in order to be able to get the advantages of uh, uh, such devices. So, um, I will continue a bit more on uh, how uh, the I.O. behavior uh, impacts the performance. So uh, no matter the device you use, uh, uh, they are able to perform better or worse depending on how you use it. And uh, 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 what the user might uh, see as uh, performance might be really orders of magnitude lower than the actual performance of the storage system that can be offered. So the most important uh, uh, factors here is the access pattern and the file I.O. model. So for the access pattern, I have categorized it in sequential and stridy. That means that uh, its uh, uh, I.O. is uh, being performed uh, next to the previous one, so or uh, stridy that we always leave a gap and this gap is uh, the same for both these patterns uh, the traditional storage uh, uh, systems and parallel file systems were working uh, really well and uh, performance of at least for throughput is not uh, bad at all even using HDDs. it's not of course as good but it's not uh, really bad when it comes now to uh, random where your access is 
are uh, all around the place, uh, then HDDs, uh, uh, as we said before, really suffer because they have uh, mechanical parts and uh, uh, they move. Uh, then another important factor is the request size. It's different to have a small request like 4K and it's different to have a, a larger uh, request size. As you increase the request size, you always uh, have better um, uh, performance. And then it's uh, to have uh, aligned accesses. So uh, all accesses to storage device um, uh, at the moment uh, are uh, based on blocks. So you always have to make sure that uh, you access data within one block or you don't want to access data that crosses two blocks because this one would uh, result in uh, uh, reading uh, uh, these two blocks, modify them and then write them uh, back where if you just write a full block there is no need for do a read operation. You can just write this block and this improves a lot. Then another um, in the other important aspect is the uh, file IO models. And uh, there are two main ones. That is the file the process and there is the shared file uh, model. I have in the next slide an illustration of that in case you're not aware. So we have the serial um, uh, IO where uh, here in the oval shapes are the processes and in the uh, rectangle uh, shapes are the files. So we have each process talks to a master process and then this master process here is the P1 will perform the IO to the file. Uh, this one of course is uh, really uh, slow and it will not scale as we increase the number of processes. Then uh, we have the parallel shared file I.O. where each process uh, will uh, talk to uh, the same file. So you see the file name is always the same. Uh, this one is better. It scales better than the first one, but uh, traditional file systems are really not doing well at all in, in this approach. And then uh, the latest one that scales uh, better than the two above for traditional file system is that each process uh, access its own um, private file. Uh, later with uh, the demo, with the Dart demo, we will um, have some applications that they will perform different kind of I.O. and we will see, uh, we will monitor the uh, performance improvement. Uh, now, uh, we have all these uh, storage systems. And um, uh, we want to be able to, to have a number that will show if this storage system is well and it's faster than the other one. Um, to do that a uh, few years back was really complicated because there was not really a standardized method and standardized benchmark to do that. But um, the community worked towards that. I think Julian was also one of the major uh, driving factors of that. And they developed the so-called uh, 500 benchmark and uh, this benchmark has uh, different uh, kind of workloads. So they call it uh, IO easy, IO hard, uh, MD easy, MD hard, and they have uh, find. So I'm not gonna go into very much details on what each of these workloads does, but executing all these workloads will result you to give you a number that this number will say how fast your storage system is compared to other uh, storage systems. So why I'm uh, referring to this one, we uh, uh, actually use uh, uh, the uh, uh, similar kind of uh, the um, 0500 idea to do some tests and uh, I will show you some results for, uh, for that. Uh, so uh, in the next uh, slides, I have some uh, numbers for uh, uh, write accesses and uh, random sequential accesses, increasing the number of uh, uh, the transfer type and also single shared file and file per process. And I have numbers for uh, the machine that uh, would be the same between all the software um, uh, that we will use the parallel file system. This is a typical uh, storage machine, let's say it's dual socket. Uh, it has a performance around 20 gigabytes, 24 NVMEs. Um, uh, 
and uh, two uh, EDR and Finiband, but uh, yeah, the actual numbers are irrelevant because it's just that we want to say to, to say that the machine is the same between the different uh, software uh, that we um, evaluate and it's a, a, a relatively new machine, it's not like something uh, outdated. So here in uh, this figure, we saw results obtained by Lustre. Lustre is one of the two major file systems in uh, in HPC. And uh, here in each of uh, uh, this one, I hope that you are able to, to uh, read that. So here it's large file per process sequential. That means that uh, uh, we have large uh, amount of uh, uh, transfer and then we have uh, each process accessing uh, its own file and in a sequential mode. And we see that Larsa really performs uh, well in this, uh, in this case. And also it performs quite well in the large file per process random. It is kind of uh, okay with a medium file per process uh, sequential, but in all the other cases, the performance is just horrible. And uh, this is what I said before that the actual um, uh, storage system might give you uh, performance that uh, you are not able to get in the application uh, layer if you are not using it very efficient uh, uh, way. In the next slide, I have uh, uh, the same uh, results obtained with uh, Spectrum Scaler 4. This is like the evolution of, uh, of uh, GPFS and uh, it's the other dominant file in the HPC community, I think. And uh, we more or less see the same issue as uh, uh, Lathra. Uh, we are not able to get uh, close to the max uh, throughput as we were with uh, Lathra in any of uh, the use cases. But uh, here we see that uh, shared file is performing better in, the, in uh, large uh, transfer size than what it was uh, with uh, Lathra. However, both of these nothing is really in uh, the area that we want it to be. So what we have to do is that we have to introduce these uh, new, uh, uh, newer devices, these faster devices, uh, the uh, flash, flash devices. Uh, from VDM, the solution that uh, we are offering is uh, uh, IME, Infinity Memory Engine, and this one is like adding uh, cache between your uh, compute nodes and your actual um, storage. And let's see how this one performs in comparison to the other ones. So uh, the difference here is really uh, uh, dramatic. We see that uh, with uh, uh, IME, we are able to outperform in all cases the other two file systems and we provide a uh, close to maximum in uh, uh, the case, in lots of cases with uh, uh, file per, uh, per process. And uh, we are also uh, able to do uh, quite well when we have a shared file uh, in a sequential manner. And uh, yeah, improving um, the uh, performance with the flash storage is not only actual the actual uh, storage device, but it is also the software that uh, sits on top of the software device. And IME is uh, a very thin software layer. Uh, so we are able to really get the benefit of uh, the devices. So now with, uh, we, we had in the previous slides here, uh, you see we have uh, results for uh, uh, random uh, access patterns and someone might argue that uh, is it really a uh, small random uh, uh, access something that we observe in the real use case or it is just for uh, micro benchmarking and uh, we have here a figure in the uh, left hand side it is like a, a airplane uh, compact airplane uh, turbine the back uh, the back side and uh, here in green uh, for example, this this part, uh, we see uh, how the actual data are stored in uh, the 
compute uh, nodes memory. So you want to have your grid uh, as closer as uh, as you can. So there is not so much uh, transfer between uh, the clients to perform uh, computation. And uh, of course, you will have some um, some uh, uh, parts where you have to uh, uh, cross uh, clients, and then you will have to send messages between clients. And this one, the red, is, let's say, a part of the grid that it is stored in a different uh, 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 client. So a, a client A will work on the green part, and the client uh, B will uh, work on the uh, red part. And uh, this it's more or less the representation they have in memory. But how is actually this uh, um, in-memory representation uh, resulting in the actual uh, file where they store these devices is something that can be uh, scattered all around the place. So we see here um, that uh, the uh, nice uh, pattern that we have here with green and red is not actually how we store it in the uh, in the file, and we have. Uh, green and uh, red and orange all around the place. And this one uh, would mean that if we want to access a part of the grid, uh, we will find we will have to perform uh, random accesses in the actual uh, file that we store. Uh, this. Yeah, yeah so, this is a very nice, nice picture, uh, Casey. Uh, where, where did you uh, uh, where did you get this? Uh, I was just curious. Uh, we will have to ask Zan, uh, Zan Thomas for that. I will. Oh, okay. As, as I nice. said before, like uh, the slides here are um, uh, Zan Thomas made some slides. I oh, made okay. No this is a slide that uh, Zan Thomas made. I did not really compose. Very, very good. Full. Very good slide. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So um, then, what uh, as as we said before, what we will need is uh, we need to add flash as an additional layer. So I will go into that in more details in, uh, in a bit, so I will skip it. But uh, what we always have to keep in mind is that uh, although we add all these new and uh, nice and fancy software uh, uh, storage devices, the software at the end will have to provide some uh, consent to the actual users. And uh, even nowadays, uh, the post consistency is uh, something that we have to follow, so the user are able to use uh, uh, to interchange the, so the storage systems without really affecting their uh, results. And uh, to have um, the, the most common one is the uh, POSIX uh, open to close uh, consistency. And here we have DeFi systems and how compliant to to POSIX there, uh, we have a ext 4 that it is more or less fully compliant. And then uh, we we have different file systems that none of them is as, as close as ext 4 but uh, GPFS and Luster are more or less the same. And uh, uh, NFS version 3 is also really, really, really good. But uh, other systems, for example, as uh, Union FS is not as, uh, as close to to that, and this might bring trouble to, to the users. So when we build a new software stacks, we have to keep in mind that we have to respect uh, the uh, consistency that users expect. And with this, I will look at the first part. Uh, no, I have, uh, OK, I have this new one more slide, and then I will uh, give to side because we are running really late. So uh, in this slide, what, uh, uh, what we are saying is that uh, in traditional uh, uh, HPC applications, uh, the right uh, operation was really dominant. So you compute uh, uh, the climate model, how it will be in the next few years. Every now and then, you write a checkpoint file, and you continue your calculation. You are sure that if something goes wrong in grass, you have the checkpoint file, and you can read to resume. But it's not like you read your checkpoint file Every time you write it, you might uh, write it and never uh, read it again. But now we are uh, moving towards uh, uh, different um, workloads as the AI workloads that are mostly 
read-driven. So this one brings new challenges to the software um, uh, stack because we are not really uh, we're not really designing software to uh, tackle these uh, patterns. And with AI, the read operation is more uh, prevalent than the write one. So you feed your uh, system with a huge amount of data. It reads the data, it trains itself, and then you will have a small uh, output. Uh, another kind of um, uh, aspect that we have to keep in mind is that nowadays uh, we do not really always have uh, on-premises uh, the storage system and we are working uh, seeing solutions that are uh, a mixture of on-premises and cloud storage uh, solutions and again we have to see how uh, we will have uh, the data flow and the connection required to have uh, uh, the user being able to really uh, benefit of this in a manner that it will be easy for them. Uh, I think for the next one, uh, Sai will talk a bit of more uh, for the software. So Sai, please go ahead, take the, uh, take the presentation from here. Thank you, Constantinos. Uh, so I'll quickly cover some of the infrastructure software side of things. And uh, thanks to uh, Constantinos, he's, he's touched upon many of these things already, like he's touched a bit upon POSIX, he's touched a bit upon the different ways to access files, you know, shared files and uh, file per process. So I'll, I'll give a very quick overview about, uh, you know, some of the file formats like uh, that you see in HPC. Uh, HDFI and NetCDF. I I'm sure that during the course of this summer school, you'll you'll go much deeper uh, into some of these data formats, especially NetCDF, which is uh, quite uh, important in climate community. And uh, I'll tell you a bit about what is this object storage uh, software. And after that, uh, you know, we can talk about the futures. So just, uh, uh, I won't cover, take a lot of time here. You know, now that uh, you have some introduction of what a parallel file system is, just to give you a feel for infrastructure software. Uh, so it's it's a way of exposing your data on the disks uh, to the different clients. Uh, so there's various ways of doing that. So with a parallel file system, uh, you essentially have your uh, server software installed in each of the different, uh, uh, you know, uh, different uh, server on the server side so that you can expose the storage uh, to the clients. And uh, on the clients, you typically see a hierarchy. You, can, you see it as a hierarchical, uh, uh, you know, typical uh, hierarchical file system. So, and then, uh, yeah, there's different ways to lay out your data between the servers uh, and you, you have a typical file, you break it down, you, you shard it, put it across the different servers and you access it in different ways and gives you different performances. So that's typically how a parallel file system works and uh, GPFS and Luster, they're all typical parallel file systems. And uh, parallel file systems have been the mainstay of HPC since uh, 2001, 2002 since uh, some of the early days of uh, Luster and then there was GPFS. Uh, and yeah, there's still a long way to go for parallel file systems. There's still a lot of optimizations that need to be done. And as Casey was pointing out, you need to have, a, you can't rely on disk-based parallel file systems anymore. You need to have a flash tier that can absorb your uh, right workloads uh, and, uh, you know, uh, get, break down that uh, ba barrier between CPU performance and disk performance. So those are some of the innovations happening in this space. And uh, let you let me give you a quick feel about uh, all this. Uh, people talk about uh, this POSIX compliancy and all these kind of things. So I'm just going to give you a quick feel for what this is. Uh, you, you, you can spend a whole day talking about this, but uh, just to give, give you a starting point to, you know, for you to do more research. So POSIX is essentially an IEEE standard, and uh, this POSIX IO there's an this POSIX IO API and POSIX IO semantics. So these are the two things you need to keep in mind. And when you talk about POSIX IO API, there is things like read, write, open, close, all these kind of things. And uh, one thing to keep in mind is that uh, you will know that in HPC, uh, for a typical EXT4 file system, uh, it's it's fine. Uh, you you open a file, you read a file, you close a file, then someone, some other processes opens, uh, you know, closes and uh, opens, uh, writes and closes. But 
one thing to keep in mind is that for HPC, this is going to be an overkill because there's millions of processors trying to read and write possibly to the same file. And if you have, if someone says that you have to have this very strict POSIX semantics needs to be applied, it's your, many processors are going to end up waiting forever and the performance is going to be very slow. And then you, you need to try and think about, uh, you know, how you can lay out your file such that even though you have POSIX, you, you can still get some reasonable performance. So that's where uh, you see uh, Casey's plot. You see so it's in some of the accesses, the performance is extremely poor. This things is because of uh, adhering to this very strict POSIX compliancy. Uh, and then uh, there's also a very prescriptive metadata as well, like all files uh, need to be organized in a directory and they all need to have some metadata and the metadata need to be in a very strict format uh, and there is no easy way to add additional descriptions to metadata. So those are the other problems with POSIX. And uh, of course, there's a big problem of consistency. The, uh, what POSIX says is that every time you read, it has to always return the results of your latest write. So which means that uh, write is required to block, you know, until it's completely committed. So if you keep uh, blocking uh, and uh, you, you do a write, you wait for it to commit, then you come out and, this, uh, it's, and you scale it out uh, for like millions of processes, it's there's going to be extreme performance penalties. So keeping all these things in mind, uh, then the, we started asking the question, you know, uh, POSIX is very good, but uh, are there some way to relax this POSIX? So, uh, you know, there is no way to, there is no need to have this very strict POSIX IO semantics. Uh, uh, and uh, most of the time get away with having a relaxed semantics. It's, there is no need to adhere to all the, you know, 100 things that the POSIX specifies. So that's what we are seeing and uh, you know object stores for example is a different way to organize your data uh, rather than in a in a strict hierarchy of files uh, and having very strict metadata you have your own your user defined way of metadata and the data is essentially just a flat uh, uh, it's kind of like a flat flat namespace you, you, and you can you you can describe how you want this data to be organized so it's a very flexible way of doing it and then, uh, so then uh, this is what an object store is. So where uh, data is essentially organized as objects rather than hierarchical files. And there's, uh, you know, there is, a, it's, it's a flat structure. You can have your own metadata. And the beauty of object store is that uh, you can overlay and impose any structure that you like. You can have a hierarchical file structure on top of objects. You can have data formats like HDFI and NetCDF on, on top of objects. So it's very flexible way, you organize it however you like. And uh, consistency is very relaxed and tunable. And uh, you, uh, there are typically things like uh, 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 key value stores that could be, for example, in memory that is used to describe your data. And the key value store, the metadata access can be super fast because it can be in your non-volatile memory or your memory. And uh, yeah, and object stores provide this uh, foundation. It's, it's basically, a, you can think of it in terms of like a, a storage operating system. It's very low level way in which data is just a set of blobs. And then on top of that, you can have S3, uh, you know, if you want to have cloud access or HDFI and things like that. So you can have multiple views on top of this uh, object store. So uh, again, I want to go, I won't go too much into detail here, but just to give you a feel that uh, there's various ways of organizing files within uh, HPC and also within the weather and climate community. Uh, and uh, they're re designed to store this very large amounts of data. And uh, uh, basically, uh, if you have a HDF file, you break it down into groups and data sets and each of the data sets map to certain files that go into a parallel file system uh, for which you can have a sequential access or random access or you can have file per process, shared file, uh, these kind of things. So it's very similar thing with the NetCDF as well, where you have uh, where you have these vectors and uh, arrays and matrices, where, where for example, uh, in climate and weather community, you have a uh, changing weather with altitude and with uh, the geographic locations. So all these, uh, the, 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 the points, the, the data that's gathered from all these points are in the form 
it's a kind of uh, uh, you know three dimensional uh, matrices uh, so the data is stored in that format all these are like data points for whether uh, you know temperature or pressure or uh, any or any such thing and these in turn are mapped to your uh, files or your objects uh, and then laid out across your infrastructure so you, you will learn a lot more about netcdf uh, you know in this uh, in, in this summer school and uh, i think uh, konstantinos uh, pointed uh, pointed this out so he covered the shared file and uh, file per process so i'll go, not go into a lot of detail uh, essentially uh, just a quick uh, this uh, there's an io uh, this uh, on mpi applications which share data uh, you know by uh, by having this uh, uh, you know by by uh, by having uh, having data in memory and sharing it between them how do you deal with the data in persistent storage for example for mpi applications uh, there is a there is a, the, the semantics that's used is uh, based on something called mpi io so it's a mechanism to access a parallel file system from your uh, classic uh, distributed uh, hpc application so uh, for mpi io is uh, you know you, uh, you, it defines the mechanisms where you have a shared file or file per process typically uh, for a shared file you can then have all the all the processes actually send data to a single process that does the io or all the process can actually have designate some uh, specific processes that collect data from the other processes and those do the io the, uh, that's called collective io so uh, typically that's what is done uh, one one kind of an optimization that's done for mpi io is you have these collect collectors which collect data around them from the processes and does the io uh, and uh, of course if you, if you want you can have also like a file per process as well which is much more uh, you know uh, gives you better performance so uh, uh, so mpi io is uh, uh, something uh, you know that that's something very relevant for this uh, for mpi application specifically and uh, the implementation of uh, mpi io for example is called rom io uh, so where which defines uh, which which is basically uh, you know goes into the semantics of the implementation and uh, some of the storage trends and uh, possible futures is uh, you see uh, 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 firstly you see nvram in the io stack i think i'll cover that very quickly uh, in in the next uh, next uh, few slides and uh, there is the advent of object stores in hpc i just pointed out and uh, i think konstantinos mentioned very early on in his talk about in storage computing so uh, storage is not just a uh, uh, not, not just a, a dumb entity that just stores data and serves up the data as required but you you should uh, you will be able to do uh, uh, computations and processing within storage and that reduces the amount of data that goes between your uh, storage and your compute so that's a new trend and the other trend is quality of service so there is quality of service for compute uh, but there is quality of service for storage and io is not well defined so uh, there could be quality of service for how much uh, access latency you want or how much uh, throughput you want or how much jitter you want so the, you can control these uh, uh, parameters by actually having a hierarchical storage system so different tiers can give you different uh, performances and the storage system overall can give you this uh, quality of service as required by applications so that's a, that's a new trend uh, and uh, that's something that has been, uh, you know, uh, that's uh, research has been ongoing. And the other thing is, uh, you have uh, data stores that is across geographies, uh, right? For example, you might have a HP, HPC workflow that requires some external data sets from some other geography as part of its workflow. So uh, there is a need to actually have a global view of all these data, uh, data pools that are spread across your geography. So software uh, mechanisms to have a federation of these data stores. Uh, so that's, uh, that's something you, you have the public clouds, but then you have the data that's coming on the edge as well, uh, closer to the devices. And there is a, the, then there's data centers that, 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 this, that this data needs to go through before it comes to the center. 
so all this data needs to there needs to be a global view of all this so there's some there needs to be some ways to federate all this so that's an that's one area of uh, uh, research and uh, possible storage and the storage trend and uh, finally there's a and one of the things is the storage system uh, can give you a lot of telemetry data uh, so how can you use that telemetry data uh, to actually build more smarter storage systems which gives you an idea of uh, predictive the uh, that gives you a feel for when a certain soft software subsystem might fail when certain infrastructure might fail so this telemetry data should be able to give you all that information and also give you a feel for uh, in general how the storage system could react to different kinds of workloads you should be able to like simulate all these kind of things so advanced telemetry uh, coming from storage system is a definite area uh, and a possible future trend and uh, yeah and as uh, um, we were both of us were mentioning there's a place for all types storage types in hpc to have this uh, uh, to to serve up what's needed for hpc application so if i uh, go to the next slide so uh, just uh, I'll, I'll cover like five or ten minutes here so this storage landscape is changing and uh, there's new storage devices appearing on the horizon we touched upon disk and ssds and flash but there's something called uh, non-volatile uh, memories as well. So, uh, so basically, uh, if, if uh, so, with, with and uh, with, with non-volatile memories and SSDs and disks, you should be able to build this hierarchical storage system. The most performant uh, uh, set of devices, very low latency, will be at the top, and the least performant, highest capacity, will be at the bottom. So note that as you go higher up in a hierarchical storage system, the, the capacity reduces, performance increases. So, uh, and that, that's because of the economics. You can't have a lot of a top tier uh, just, just because the, the, the cost is going to be uh, cost and maybe even uh, the uh, energy implication is going to be uh, qu you know, qu quite a lot. Uh, so uh, you typically, uh, uh, and when you have a hierarchical storage system, you can actually use parallel file systems where you can have a burst buffer of flash and a parallel file system, or you can have an object store that exposes all these different types of tiers. And the data uh, can move between these different tiers based on like user-driven policy or based on some machine learning uh, uh, way, of, uh, way of doing it. Doing it. So a storage class memory essentially sits between your flash and DRAM. Uh, so in terms of cost, in terms of performance, uh, and it can, uh, the storage class memories uh, are devices which have the characteristics of memory as well as the characteristics of storage. So you can use it as memory as well. Uh, the, the difference between storage class memory and memory is if you, if you turn on the power, turn off the power data still remains in a in a storage class memory but in a dram it it goes away so that actually gives the whole storage system very interesting characteristics uh, so you, of course what you could do is uh, you can build a block based uh, storage system out of these storage class memories that that can have very good performance or you can just have it as like uh, sto just use it as memories which are persistent so that's a very new trend in storage systems today and within HPC as well is this arrival of storage class memories and uh, just going to the uh, so uh, so it sits essentially between your DRAM and SSDs as I was pointing out. So the most uh, uh, important storage class memory that's out there uh, for use is a so-called 3D cross point. So that's a technology developed by uh, Micron and uh, uh, used, uh, uh, you know, Micron and Intel have a close collaboration on this one. So Intel actually ma uh, markets this as well. Uh, so this uh, this is the probably the only storage class memory uh, that's uh, that's in very very wide use. Uh, so there's, however, there's a lot of research going on in storage class memories. Uh, you know, there's. You, if you look at the research, you can see so many things like uh, RE-RAM and face change memory and uh, MRAM and STT-RAM. So there's so many different uh, like uh, animals in the SCM zoo. <laughs> and uh, some of them have never come to fruition and uh, some of them are still in research. 
So somehow the idea is to get very close to DRAM memory performance, but which can also give And uh, yeah, I just uh, so I just mentioned this already, and I think I covered this one. So uh, so this is a quick overview of and so 3D crosspoint. Uh, so this is a slide from Intel. So 3D crosspoint gives you this uh, very low latency, and most of the latency is uh, like the software latency is uh, primarily half of that, and uh, the device latency is extremely low compared to. Uh, NAND, uh, SSD NAND or uh, HDDs. So this is uh, and uh, the protocol to access uh, 3D cross point. Of course, it's we assume that it's a NVMe protocol, which uh, Constantinos already uh, uh, introduced. So this is uh, just an example of uh, one hierarchical storage system, which is a research system uh, that uh, is uh, that we are uh, uh, that uh, that we do as part of a European uh, uh, that EU R and D project. So this is a hierarchical storage system that's uh, installed in Ulic, uh, where you have NVRAM tier at the top, then you have uh, uh, NVMe attached devices, and then you have flash SSDs and uh, SASs and uh, uh, very high density uh, drives, everything. Uh, so in, in, in this research prototype that uh, Seagate is and a few other partners are involved, we, we are trying to expose all of these as one big storage system. Uh, and uh, you can have different, uh, which can give you all the performance that you that you have in the across the performance uh, profile, uh, across the performance in terms of performance as well as capacity. Uh, and so just uh, just give you an example feel for a hierarchical storage system, and there'll be more and more hierarchical storage systems. Uh, so and for example, even uh, even the IA, IME, the burst buffer, even that's an example of a kind of a hierarchical storage system where you have flash tiers and disk tiers. And here, uh, the difference is you have non-volatile memories as well. So non-volatile memory SSDs, high density, high performance drives, low performance drives. Uh, so yeah, for for a uh, and typically you can have this uh, hierarchical storage system uh, managed as some of these tiers can be exposed independently by parallel file systems, or you can have uh, what 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 has been been done in this example is everything is exposed as a uh, through the object storage uh, platform itself. So the blobs, the objects can be in any and uh, and they can move between these tiers. And uh, from an application perspective, you can have a POSIX view to these objects, or you can have a HDF5 or NetCDF or any of these kind of views. And uh, and, and yeah, with 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 uh, for, with this example storage system called Sage, we have a, a compute capability close to storage as well. So yeah, just a quick view of the technical challenges in uh, hierarchical uh, storage system is fault tolerance. There can be faults across and anywhere in the stack, and there can be uh, uh, all of these different tiers have different failure characteristics, and uh, you need to handle all these uh, different hardware failures. And for that, you need to have uh, things like uh, uh, for, for hard drives, you have RAID. Uh, but then uh, there is new ways of making RAID even better. It's called a network RAID, or parity declustered RAID, where you have data and parity all split up all over the place so that you can make use of the bandwidth of all the devices for very quick recovery. So uh, look up parity declustered RAID and uh, recording. I think that's that's uh, something very uh, uh, important and interesting for from the terms of fault tolerance and reliability. And uh, for moving data across tiers in a hierarchical storage system, you need to have a policy engine that needs to have inputs from the admin that needs to get some hints from the application and it can also be machine learning driven as well. So based on the usage of the data, uh, you know, you can move data across these tiers based on uh, when they needed. So those smart kind of things can be done and it's not yet done today. Uh, so it, it can it can be driven by telemetry in some sense. So this is another uh, interesting uh, aspect of hierarchical storage systems. Uh, so with this, I think, uh, yeah, I, I gave you a quick flavor uh, for, uh, you know, what's uh, what's happening. 
in hierarchical storage systems and infrastructure software and the trends so uh, i encourage you to you know start this material will be available uh, so hopefully this is a starting point for you all to do more research into this and uh, yeah that's uh, that's it from my side hopefully i'm uh, i tried to get back to the time schedule uh, constantinos <laughs> so oh, i'll uh, no, give it back to you <laughs> You, you did great. Um, I saw a question that was actually uh, asked uh, way before, but uh, you mentioned the point and I would like to get back to, to it. So you mentioned the fault tolerance and uh, one of the attenders mentioned that uh, the, uh, the lifetime of SSDs is low and you need to do things like uh, where leveling. Uh, uh, you, you have answered on um, uh, Zan mentioned that there were issues with uh, SSD's uh, uh, lifetime. So a uh, few slides back. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, feel feel free to add uh, comments to that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So just just uh, because I, I might be interested, in, uh, uh, someone might be interested on on that. So here uh, you mentioned fault tolerance, and of course one of the most important aspects of uh, the storage system how fast you give a storage system is uh, worth nothing if it is not uh, fault tolerance right you want something that you will be able to read your data and you want something that the data you stored uh, will not uh, vanish and disappear otherwise nobody would uh, would really buy something so uh, one of the most important aspects that we yeah maybe it, we have not uh, um, mentioned it and uh, focused uh, on that is that storage should be uh, really bullet uh, uh, proof and uh, traditionally with uh, hard disk drives we had uh, the so-called uh, raids that uh, will uh, were able to withstand uh, failures but these failures on, were only on uh, hard disk drives uh, on their own now with uh, the newer um, storage devices like um, uh, ssds and uh, flash storage we don't really do uh, raid anymore and we do the uh, eraser encoding and uh, uh, that it is uh, way way better um, raid uh, on its own is not really aware of uh, which uh, part of the device is used so do more or less if you if an if a hard drive fails, you resilver your RAID system by uh, rear uh, by bringing a new one and uh, rebuilding all the hard drive. Uh, this is, of course, uh, uh, really slow since uh, for the unused part of the device, you spend uh, time rebuilding. Uh, now with the flash storage uh, uh, and the eraser recording, we do we don't do such uh, such things. For example, for the IME product uh, um, I'm uh, mainly working on, we have uh, uh, eraser recording, and uh, we send uh, only uh, at uh, the moment that the client uh, has a bunch of data that wants to write. We compute the uh, parity groups. And then we send in a different servers the data and the parity group. And in case of a failure, we are able to reconstruct the actual data. And uh, we do that in a uh, uh, very fine grain. And we keep uh, track of uh, which part of the device is being used. So the receiving process is uh, way, way faster. Yeah. And uh, uh, also, the computation of the parity is done on. Uh, uh, software on the client uh, side that uh, improves uh, performance. Just a, a glimpse uh, of uh, what we do on the SSDs uh, and to be able to to trust them because uh, yes, they might fail uh, as as you use them. However, the way you use them also uh, uh, results uh, in the uh, life. Uh, expectancy and there are many many techniques there uh, there are specific methods like the unmap and uh, trim operations that uh, you can use to expand the lifetime of uh, the uh, the device so this is what i wanted to to mention uh, please uh, feel free to ask questions we have not taken that many questions and 
I think we have uh, some minutes uh, for that, and it would yeah. be nice to see how did you like the presentation. If there are uh, some things that are cloudy, of course, we went a bit uh, uh, covered a lot of material in a small amount of time. So uh, I've been trying to answer some questions. Yeah. yeah. I've been trying to answer some questions on the chat as much as I can, but uh, sorry, I could not answer all of them. So uh, feel free to ask me and uh, Casey uh, any other uh, questions that you may have. I think uh, one I think one question from Pablo is uh, that I haven't answered is about the telemetry. It's about the amount of data that will be in storage or is uh, the status of the file system. So, uh, uh, so, so Pablo, to answer your question, uh, telemetry is the status of the file system. So it's a uh, amount of, uh, so basically telemetry is uh, uh, essentially all the tiers in the hierarchical storage system or any, any parallel file system storage infrastructure. So hard, the, all the hard drive, all the servers, all the hard drives, they're all equipped to give you telemetry information and your sto software infrastructure can also be enabled to do that. Uh, so it uh, by looking at holistically at all this telemetry information, you can uh, gleam, you can get an idea of about the state of your whole system, and you can uh, visualize what's going on in your whole system. So, and if you if you you can actually uh, increase the amount of telemetry data, it gives you uh, more insight into what's happening in your system. You can dial it down. It gives uh, you know you have lesser insights so one of the problems for example in luster with telemetry was that uh, yeah, there was a lot of logs and it was very very hard to come up with uh, identify what's actually going on in the system just by data administrator looking at these logs so uh, some of that uh, yeah, so can be uh, can be further improved if you have a very good uh, telemetry analytics capability where, uh, uh, where there's a very good schema in which you can, all the infrastructure components can give you data and you can analyze. So yeah, that's some, just some thoughts from my side. Yes, uh, some more questions, uh, Casey, if I, if I can, maybe you yourself or myself can take this. So this is Neil Davis um, says that many tools are being developed to work with S3. Uh, is there a place for implementing a local S3 based system in HPC today? How does S3 compared with POSIX uh, limitations earlier? Uh, I can take this. Uh, maybe Casey, you have some uh, initial thought on S3 versus POSIX and HPC. Uh, we actually have, uh, uh, we are participating in the European Union and project uh, is called Evolve that we are supposed to bring these two worlds uh, really, really close. Mm. Um, but uh, Sai, please go ahead. Yes, so, so yes, S3 has a, typically S3 uh, has been designed with the requirements of cloud in mind for uh, steering data sets across a cloud. But what's happening is that uh, now within HPC, uh, there are data sets that are actually distributed and there are sensors uh, that actually collect the data and that needs to be sent to your HPC data center. So for that use case, you need to have your center, uh, the, the center uh, data, uh, the HPC center needs to, the, the data sets need to be exposed, have a cloud interface for actually uh, loading external data sets. And that's where S3 comes into picture. So S3 is just a kind of a gateway into accessing your data uh, for, uh, you know, uh, for your uh, storage system. For example, if you have an object store, based uh, uh, data center you can have a s3 uh, a gateway if it is ceph you can have a s3 LibreDOS gateway or if it is based on like miro you can have a s3 uh, gateway on top of miro or uh, you can also have a s3 server on top of something like a uh, parallel file system so s3 is just a way to access the data sets uh, into into hpc and it's becoming more and more important to have a s3 interface for your hpc data center and S3 is very different from uh, POSIX per se. S3 just specifies, the semantics of S3 is uh, 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 very simple. It's uh, base, basically you have REST type uh, interfaces where you can say like, uh, where, where you just uh, put data or get data. So the interfaces uh, for accessing data over a cloud are not as strict as what you have for POSIX. 
for a POSIX is what you have for a local file system accessing data locally with very, very strict semantics. So uh, you, you don't have to have all that uh, for a S3. You don't have to. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, very simplistic protocol to access data over the over the cloud. So HPC uh, for S3 POSIX, they'll all be uh, they, they're all required uh, uh, to actually give you the uh, full usage of HPC data centers. Yeah. In today's world, it's really in, important to bring these two worlds uh, together. So for uh, the, the Evolve project, uh, we have used cases as uh, uh, agriculture or uh, smart mm. marine, yeah. uh, 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 the automatic um, uh, driving, self-driving cars. So there are so many use cases uh, that uh, you will have to bring uh, data uh, from uh, the world close to your uh, computation, that would be the HPC facility. And to do that, you will need something like S3. Let's see if there's any other questions. Uh, yeah, Neil Davis also mentions that uh, they have a Ceph as our storage system. Uh, so yeah, he will talk to his admins about adding the S3. So thank you, uh, Neil. It's good that uh, our, our chat, uh, you know, gave you uh, gave you this thought. Okay, is there some uh, some more questions? So yeah, if, if you can just type it in the uh, in the chat as well, so myself or Casey can take this. Yeah, I guess uh, that's it, uh, Constantinos. So I think. Yeah. I will hand you over the rest of the session and uh, I, I will uh, drop out now. But uh, yeah. yeah. Many, many thanks for uh, the presentation that yeah. I, you gave. Um, uh, nice information about many uh, different aspects of the storage systems and uh, the future of them. Yeah, thank you, every, thank you everyone. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me through, uh, through the coordinators, uh, through, the, through Julian and uh, others. So thank you, Julian, for the opportunity as well.